sounds like the <laughs> it's inevitable small glitches will happen including um by me <laughs> So thank you everybody for joining us today as part of our 11th annual Tribal Healing to Wellness Court Enhancement Training. Uh, my name is Pat Sikiakwaptiwa, and you are welcome to call me Pat. That is perfectly fine. Uh, a little about myself. Um, I am Hopi from Arizona, but I am also most recently faculty at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Department of Alaska Native Studies and Rural Development. And I've had the privilege over the years of working with tribes up in Alaska on their court development before coming to serve with the University of Alaska. And I also serve as a tribal appellate justice for my own court system back home in Arizona on the Hopi reservation. So this particular panel is titled Special Considerations. And I wanted to say a little bit about that um, before launching into our slide set today. So special considerations uh, is, is the term I use because I'm very interested in launching a dialogue about the possibility of developing an intertribal juvenile healing to wellness court in Alaska. And this has come about because of my observations in working with both tribes in rural Alaska and also, um, um, I'm, I'm seeing that somebody raised a hand, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, does somebody want to ask a question? Click under more. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just keep going here. Oh, I see. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing people in the in the chat. Um, welcome to those of you who are my former or current or or know of other students from UAF. Um, okay, so let me just get back on track here because I'll get distracted if I look at the chat too much. Um, there's some things that I have observed over the years in working with tribes in rural Alaska that caused me to want to start to explore this possibility of an inner tribal juvenile healing to wellness court. Um, and they are the, the conflicts over jurisdiction, tribal jurisdiction in Alaska, the incredible resource deficits to tribes and tribal justice systems and law enforcement systems in Alaska, and also um, the fact that there's such a great need for juvenile tribal healing to wellness courts to deal with the overlap between alcohol use, abuse, and dependency and violence in rural Alaska. So I'm starting the dialogue here today, later this year, working with TLPI. We hope to come out with a publication that will further explore some of the things we're looking at here. And um, I hope that you'll use the chat in today's session to raise any obvious um, questions or issues that might pop out or even to just share some of your knowledge about what's going on in your particular community. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and um, move to the next slide. And Cindy is moving my slides for me, great. So we're going to focus today on the juvenile model of the tribal healing to wellness courts. And I want to consider the implications for the development of a couple of different things. The possibility of having a single tribal healing to wellness court, meaning that one tribe operates its own whole justice system in this juvenile arena. The second possibility is for a joint jurisdiction court. That's where a tribe and a state work together to run the justice system of that juvenile healing to wellness court program. And the third possibility, which I'm um, hoping we'll really think about is the possibility of the intertribal healing to wellness court. Okay, Cindy, move us ahead a slide. So before we get into the nitty gritty though, I wanted to remember why any of us are doing this, particularly those of us who might find ourselves um, as tribal leaders or on a tribal healing to wellness court team. 
So here is a picture from the Colville Tribal Court um, Wellness Program. And this is one of their graduating participants. And I won't read the whole quote, but some things just jumped out at me. He said, I just wanted to do it for my daughter. This is the biggest accomplishment in my life. And it's pretty crazy how far I came. And for some of our participants who've been leading really difficult lives, um, this is as big or bigger than graduating from high school or graduating from college. And it sets them on a path that they would not otherwise have been able to accomplish. And so this is the reason that we do what we do. Okay, let's move ahead a slide, please. Okay, so what is a tribal healing to wellness court? I'm just gonna go over some of the basics so that we're all on the same page when we get to the questions. So there are multiple names for these courts. Um, they, they originally were called drug courts. Um, they also are called therapeutic courts, tribal drug courts. And in our program, the Tribal Healing to Wellness, um, I'm sorry, in the Tribal Law and Policy Institute world, we call them tribal wellness courts or tribal healing to wellness courts. They're all the same things. Um, and so you may hear different terminology here. So there's also different subtypes, right? You can have courts that focus on sort of people who are in the adult criminal realm. You can have courts that focus on, um, they call them family drug courts. These uh, where children are alleged to have been maltreated or abused and the parent is going through the drug court. You can have uh, some that focus on juveniles or people charged with driving under the influence. Um, you can have some that focus on veterans. So there's different um, problems that get targeted by these different kinds of courts. Uh, and as you can see, the participants in these drug court programs, um, they're not called defendants, they're called participants. They may have been charged with a crime, a juvenile offense, they may be accused of child maltreatment, but all of them have also been screened to have either substance use, abuse, or dependency problems. Overall, right now, we think there are about 117 tribal healing to wellness courts nationally, and this says in the lower 48, but it actually should say nationally. Um, and you can see the bulk of those are what we consider adult wellness courts those would be the kinds of cases that would move from a criminal tribal court docket to a um, adult therapeutic docket. And then the next big category is juvenile wellness courts. Um, there seems to be about 40 of those. Um, these numbers could be greater now because um, this, these are numbers from last year. Okay, let's go forward. So what are the goals of these drug courts? Well, as you may know, the original model for these therapeutic courts came from the state system. And they had threefold goals in the beginning. One, to reduce the use of drugs and or alcohol uh, among people who are coming before their court systems, particularly their criminal court systems. Two, to reduce related criminal activity. And three, to increase the cost effectiveness of the justice system. Now, this number three factor um, is a highly, um, I would call it a political necessity in the state court system because people in the justice system have to convince people in the legislature to spend money on drug courts because they are more costly in some ways. Um, and so they're always looking at whether there's a cost effectiveness when they decide which population they're gonna target drug courts on. So number three here is a, is a high or an important goal of the state drug courts, but I would argue that it is not necessarily so for tribal drug courts. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so you'll see when we look at tribal juvenile healing to wellness courts, the list of goals get longer. Now you'll see the first and the third bullets here are the same kinds of goals as in the state system. 
So there's a goal of reducing the use of alcohol and or drugs among young people caught up in tribal courts. And three, to reduce related status offenses, juvenile offenses and criminal activity of youth. So those are similar, but then look at all these other goals. Um, and, and you can ask yourself whether any of these are political necessities in a tribal community, but there are things like um, strengthening families and keeping them together, providing pro-social activities and interventions for native youth, um, providing some kind of treatment for native youth, whether we're talking about dealing with substance use and abuse or behavioral health issues, to provide some programs that have hybrid culture, cultural and Western elements for native youth and families. And then of course, um, the juvenile healing, tribal healing to wellness court funding is also a means to develop and enhance tribal courts and tribal justice systems because they tend to be under-resourced. And so this funding and process can also um, bolster the actual tribal court and justice system itself. Okay, let's go ahead a slide. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to throw out there is this concept of nation building. And this was originally expounded by, uh, I believe um, Stephen Cornell is an economist. Uh, and he noted that tribes when doing development or service provision, some tribes were self-governing and some were merely self-administrating. And these observations arose in response to tribes um, running their own programs in, after, the, after 1975 when Congress passed the Indian Self-Determination Act. And so what's the difference and why does it matter? So there's a difference between just going after federal funds to launch a program um, that meets the requirement of the federal funding. That, that would be mere self-administration and self-governance where your community or your justice system has actually done the strategic planning. They figured out what they need and then they go get the funding to meet those needs. And so Cornell's definition of self-governance is native nations that seize authority and govern. They assert rights and capacities to reshape their nations according to their own design, to make and enforce their own laws, to develop and pursue long-term strategies of community development, to negotiate new relationships with other governments, and to exercise meaningful jurisdiction over lands and people within their borders. Now you might ask me, what the heck does this have to do with juvenile healing to wellness courts? Well, I suppose the question that would arise is whether your um, juvenile healing to wellness program is a mere diversion program where the state court acts as the court and then just diverts cases to your program, but the state is really running the court part of it. Or are you setting up a tribal court system, justice system that is then diverting cases over to its, pro, its own program? Now, there may be good reasons um, that you have thought through as part of self-governance to either do a joint jurisdiction court or to be only a diversion program. But the point is to have thought about it um, and to be thinking about it from sort of a long-term strategic perspective instead of sort of just defaulting to being sort of that mere program or mere self-administration. Um, some of this may be kind of controversial, but I'll, I'll throw it out there because this is what some of the tribal law scholars and federal Indian law scholars are thinking about. Okay, let's go forward a slide. Okay, back to some of the basics here. Um, some of you know that if you're already operating a drug court, that there are um, in the state court system, there are standards for these courts called the 10 key components. And those of you who are running your own tribal healing to wellness courts may know that there is a separate set of standards 
called the Tribal um, Healing to Wellness Court Key Components, and there are also 10. And today I just wanted to point out two of the 10 that distinguish tribal healing to wellness courts from state drug courts. So number one is a team approach, which is the same, but you'll notice for tribes, the team includes courts, tribal court, treatment services, which is usually um, either tribally provided or tribally contracted, and the native community. So we've got this extra team member in the tribal key components. And it's a team approach to healing individuals and their families and their communities as part of nation building. So the tribal healing to wellness courts under the tribal key components include nation building and the community and families in a way that the key components in the state system do not. The other one I wanted to point out here is number four. Uh, treatment and rehabilitation incorporates culture and tradition. So under the tribal key components, treatment can also be things that are known to the native community um, under their own system, under their own healing and wellness mechanisms. And that can be incorporated into the design of the tribal healing to wellness court. Okay, let's go forward a slide. So we're still covering basics here. What other folks may not know so much about is that there is another set of standards for juvenile drug courts in the state system. And this is called the 16 strategies to improve juvenile drug courts. And I'm only gonna point out a few of these. Um, particularly, I wanted to look at six, seven and eight. And the differences here are not differences about culture necessarily, but they're differences about youth and young people. So for example, under number six, the standard is for these programs at courts and programs to build partnerships with community organizations to expand the range of opportunities available to youth and their families. Why is this important in Alaska, rural Alaska in particular? Well, we know those are hard things to come by, right? Community organizations that provide a range of opportunities for youth and their families. We may not have a lot of those, um, but we may have some of those and they should be incorporated into uh, any juvenile tribal healing to wellness court. Seven is to tailor interventions to the complex and varied needs of youth and their families. So unlike in an adult criminal situation where the intent, the attention of the whole system is focused on the grown up, the, the person, the adult criminal um, person, in a juvenile setting, we're going to focus our attention on not only the young person who is alleged to have committed, let's say, a juvenile offense, but also their families because they come together and they need to work together to be able to heal in this process. Okay, let's look at number 10. It's also important to create policies and procedures that are responsive to cultural differences uh, and train personnel to be culturally competent. So there is a cultural um, element or standard, even under the state system, um, it'd be really great at some point for uh, TLPI and all of those tribal healing to wellness courts in the juvenile arena to come together and do a tribal version of these 16 strategies. Okay, oh, I missed the most important one here. Um, number eight tailored treatments to the developmental needs of adolescents. This is a big ask in rural Alaska um, for a number of reasons. One primary one being that a lot of the treatment services for rural Alaskans are in hub locations very far away from the villages. And so not only do people not have direct access to treatment locally, but that treatment is not necessarily guaranteed to be designed for young people, for adolescents. And so if that is a standard requirement for this kind of juvenile tribal healing to wellness court, 
the access to that is a big question mark. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if I should pause here for a minute and see if any of our um, maybe uh, Precious or maybe Laura, um, what are the raised hands I see on the monitor? Are there any questions that I should stop and address right now? Hi, Pat. I've reached out to them um, and we have not received a response. Okay. So keep on going. Okay, and we will have 15 minutes at the end. So if you had raised your hand, you can go ahead and jump back in with a question or comment. All right, let's talk about one of the big elements of these drug courts or these tribal healing to wellness courts. And it's what they call a phase treatment plan. And I don't wanna go into minute detail. I just wanna make a few points. One is that, these new kinds of court dockets, these therapeutic court dockets are not just court hearings. They um, pull together teams of people in that system to oversee a phase treatment plan. And I would actually term this differently if it were me, I would call it a phased plan that includes treatment. Because what it is, is it's kind of a checklist of things that this team reviews for that young person and their family over the course of months and maybe even more than a year. So one of the requirements in this plan includes treatment services. And those may be provided by a treatment provider who also has their own phases that they're moving people through with say drug and alcohol treatment, um, behavioral health treatment, et cetera. And what I want you to get out of this is that this plan includes um, lots of things that villages in rural Alaska may not have. The biggest one being treatment. It may not be locally frequently accessible at the village level. And so that raises the huge question of how do we launch a successful tribal juvenile healing to wellness court in villages in rural Alaska that are not located um, in hub cities or, or don't have sort of the, um, the confluence of resources that say um, Kenaitse Indian tribe has or Sitka has or um, Native Village of Barrow has. Um, there, and remember, there's over 200 tribes that are federally recognized in Alaska. So many of them may run into difficulty accessing the resources for these phase treatment plans. Okay, let's move ahead a slide. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you here is a diagram of the tribal juvenile court process set out under the Model Indian Juvenile Code of 2016. So some of you may know that the Bureau of Indian Affairs contracted to have a model juvenile, a model tribal juvenile code drafted for tribes to use as a template to update their tribal juvenile laws. And I wanted to show you what it does. And it is designed to work with tribal healing to wellness courts. So it's designed on the one hand to provide um, a juvenile court process that has fairness in it for young people, due process. And then it creates these doorways, these big blue bubbles here. It creates these doorways for that process to move juvenile cases into a tribal therapeutic court process. Uh, so let me just talk it through here. So, Let's say a young person is alleged to have committed an assault on somebody while they were drinking. So they've been alleged to have committed a delinquent act. And then a juvenile case coordinator under this code will investigate that, meet with that young person and their family. If they can reach some um, informal uh, plan to resolve that, it may never go to tribal court. 
that case also could get diverted right there by agreement with that young person and his family to a tribal healing to wellness court process, program, docket, whatever you wanna call it. If that doesn't work out, a delinquency petition can get filed in tribal court and then the tribal judge will hold an initial hearing and get ready for a trial. And, and this is how it would work in many lower 48 tribes. Now at that point, there's a second chance. The young person and or their attorney, if they have one or lay advocate, can move the court, they can ask the judge to defer the trial and give them a chance to go to tribal healing to wellness court. And if they can succeed there, then all of this will stop. If they fail in that process, then the trial goes forward in tribal juvenile court. And either the young person will admit to doing it or evidence will be presented to prove that they did what they're alleged to have done. And at that point, um, there's a third chance the young person and or their lawyer or lay advocate can move to defer the sentencing, otherwise known as disposition, in that case. If they go to Tribal Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court and succeed there, then it all stops. If that doesn't work, then they go forward to a sentencing hearing. And at that point in lower 48 um, tribal courts, they can actually go to detention, secure detention otherwise known as juvie, right? Um, so the model code is really designed with um, lower 48 um, tribal court systems and detention systems. They're almost quasi criminal looking, even though it's a civil court process. And that's how this diagram works. It moves cases from one, port, one part of the tribal court to another part of the tribal court. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So one of the questions I wanna pitch out there for you, and you can answer this at your leisure as I move through the rest of the slides is, I wanna ask you, is your tribal healing to wellness body, is it a court? Is it a tribal court? Or is it only a tribal program? And if it's only a tribal program, do you want it to be part of a tribal court? Are there practical reasons for leaving the court process with the state and not with the tribe? Um, and I know these are um, loaded questions, but there may be good reasons for doing this and we'd love to know what they are and what your thoughts about it are. So think about these questions and type up in the, in the text box, what you're thinking and we'll capture that at TLPI. Um, and we'll also, we can answer questions about this at the end of this session. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I promised you a bit of an Alaska case study here and I'd like to do that. So one of the first things that anyone who's lived up here or who is from here always points out is Alaska is a huge place. It, look how big it is when you overlie it on states in the lower 48. It is huge. It is diverse. There are more than 200 federally recognized tribes here from different culture and language groups. Um, many of those villages are not on a road system. The only way to get to them um, seasonally is by plane or by boat. Um, many of them have to access resources in cities that are hub cities that are hundreds of miles away. So you'd have to get on an airplane to go see your counselor. Some of them you have um, maybe counselors flown in, but only like once a month or by some other increment. And that often gets um, undone by weather, bad weather. So um, you, Alaska is unique and it's diverse and its geography makes everything more difficult. Okay, let's go forward a, a, a slide. So what are some of the big challenges facing tribes in Alaska that want to develop tribal healing to wellness courts? Well, lack of funding has to be at the top of the list. 
lack of funding for tribes, for tribal courts, for regional native nonprofits that provide a lot of the services to tribes. As a consequence, the state takes the lead in juvenile and criminal justice, and it has insufficient funds to do so in rural Alaska, and the state is under an unprecedented budget crisis right now and has been for a number of years. There is late and limited state recognition of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction. Today, uh, the state of Alaska recognizes tribes as having what they call member jurisdiction. So they recognize that tribes have power over their tribal members and they do not recognize any territorial jurisdiction or jurisdiction over non-natives, for example. There's a lot of confusion over tribal territorial jurisdiction because of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And I could do a whole course on that for you and it would suck up all our time. Needless to say, the US Supreme Court has found that much of the land that tribes would consider their Aboriginal homelands in Alaska fall under ANCSA. And that is not considered Indian country um, Therefore, uh, tribes, many tribes in Alaska are seen not to have territorial jurisdiction. There's confusion over tribal juvenile jurisdiction. I've been describing it to you here and it sounds like a criminal process, but in most tribal courts, it's actually a civil process that has um, some symptoms that look criminal, but it's actually a civil process. So it would fall under a tribe's civil jurisdiction. Uh, there are problems with regional versus local service provision, and I've talked to you about that already. And of course, same problem with law enforcement. There's very little frequent, effective local law enforcement in the rural villages in Alaska. And I've already talked to you about the problems with geography and the weather system, especially for tribes that don't aren't on the road system in Alaska. Okay, let's go forward. All right, so I'm showing you a very um, probably brain numbing diagram here. And I just wanna tell you a few things about it. So David Case, who is like the scholar, he's like the Felix Cohen of Alaska. He's an attorney who's worked with tribes his whole life. And he describes this, the governmental system in Alaska as a complex non-system of entities, meaning there's no system to it and it's very complicated. Um, and it has a lot to do with the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and other sort of all those other factors I've been talking to you about. So you'll see um, there are tribal governments here. There's about 90 traditional governing councils that were recognized under ANCSA. There are about 70 Indian Reorganization Act governing councils. There's a congressionally recognized um, tribe that's intertribal called the Tlingit and Haida Central Council. Um, and then uh, the other thing I would like you to notice is um, Alaska Native corporations up in the upper right hand corner here. Um, we hear a lot about those, but notice they're not governments, they're corporations. And then there's another set of corporations that people often don't, outside of Alaska, don't realize. These are the regional native nonprofit corporations that on the bottom right hand corner here like Arctic Slope Native Association, Kawarik, et cetera. These native nonprofits are the entities that get a lot of the federal dollars and maybe state dollars too, to provide services to the tribes. And in the lower 48, these services would be under tribal government like um, law enforcement, if a tribe has its own law enforcement, behavioral health, uh, treatment programs in the substance area. Um, so this is why it's a bunch of different entities in a complicated way here that sort of um, influence and run things in rural Alaska. You have tribal governments, ANCSA corporations, 
regional native nonprofits, and you have to think about all of them when you're designing a tribal healing to wellness court. Okay, let's move forward a slide. So many of you might remember that Congress created the Indian Law and Order Commission nationally in 2010 to investigate um, criminal justice system issues in Indian country. And they issued a report in 2013. Some of their findings were specific to Alaska. So they found that there were 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska. By the way, you'll see 230 listed in a lot of places. So we need to pull up the list and start counting. Um, they also found about 78 operating tribal courts. Legal scholars who are writing about Alaska now will tell you there's about over there's over 100 operating tribal courts. Um, the ILOC found that they operated with limited um, funding and narrow jurisdiction, and they tended to handle child welfare, customary adoptions, public drunkenness, disorderly conduct, and minor juvenile offenses. What might this have to do with tribal juvenile healing to wellness courts? Well, we can see that the possibilities here uh, for the need for family drug courts and, and juvenile drug courts. Okay, let's go forward. So the ILOC issued some recommendations and their strategy was to increase territorial jurisdiction for tribes so that they would have more power in their tribal court systems and in their lawmaking. And so how would they do this? Um, they wanted Congress to declare that village fee lands, this, these are ANCSA lands formerly probably, um, that they're Indian country. So basically um, reverse the Venati decision by statute. Um, also, they recommended that Congress allow tribes to take lands into trust to create more Indian country, more territorial jurisdiction. And we now know that the Department of Interior did change its regulations and started taking uh, petitions for lands into trust. Um, maybe only one or two of those was ever granted before uh, the Trump administration put it all on hold. And now um, there's petitions just sitting there and we'll see what happens. Um, another recommendation was that Congress increase resources to tribes for tribal justice systems and law enforcement. That's money. Um, the third was to affirm the inherent criminal jurisdiction of Alaska Native tribal governments within the external boundaries of their villages and over tribal members. Currently, there are uh, legal scholars arguing that um, tribes in Alaska have inherent criminal jurisdiction over their members within the boundaries of their villages. And it's a different argument than expanding Indian country. It's, it's an idea that they have jurisdiction over their members regardless of whether or not they have territorial jurisdiction. Okay, let's go forward one slide. Okay, so there's really no doubt that the drug of choice in Alaska is alcohol and that it comes um, side by side with violence and that the numbers in rural Alaska are through the roof and they have been for ages. Um, so there's a desperate need for a drug courts or a wellness court system to come in and not just be pouring native people into the Alaska criminal justice system. There is no doubt the need is there and that tribes want to be able to handle those problems uh, from their own point of view and with the resources to do it. Um, the other thing I would point out here is it's just it's not just Alaska natives. Uh, these things are true of all Alaskans when you look at the statistics. Um, the numbers may be worse in rural Alaska, but Alaskans have problems with alcohol, even if they're not native. Let's go forward one slide. Okay, another um, eye popping diagram here. I just wanted to point out across the top here is the classic um, process for a tribal juvenile court in rural Alaska under tribal codes that I'm seeing in rural Alaska. So 
they're less, uh, it's sort of a modified form of the process that you would see under um, the model code that I showed you before. And you can see the dispositions are different. Um, so tribal courts in rural Alaska are not sending young people to secure detention or juvie. Instead, they're finding them, they're giving them community service, traditional activities, treatment counseling, um, they require restitution, or they may confiscate their personal property, or there may be banishment. Um, and I'm generalizing here based on some of the codes I've seen. What is missing is the bottom half of the diagram in most cases, which is the whole tribal juvenile healing to wellness court docket and its process, right? That idea that you're moving young people out of that regular tribal court process and you're screening them to see if they're eligible to participate in a tribal juvenile healing to wellness court docket um, that has a team of people that are meeting weekly, uh, that has a phased treatment plan with random alcohol and drug testing of young people, has personal development and cultural programming. All of the bottom half of this diagram is what may be missing for tribes that don't have a tribal healing to wellness court. Think, that, think about that bottom of the diagram requiring money and coordination, um, things that would have to be bolstered for a tribal healing to wellness court in rural Alaska. Okay, let's go forward. Now you might ask, has anyone done this well in Alaska? Is there a tribe that we can look to? And there were some exper experiments in Kenaitse or Kenai, um, where we have the Kenaitse Indian tribe. Um, they were experimenting and may still be doing so with tribal state joint jurisdiction therapeutic courts. Otherwise you might uh, call it a, a tribal healing to wellness court that is a joint jurisdiction court. So what they did, which was really interesting is they had the tribal judge sit with the state judge side by side, case by case to hear cases in both civil and criminal matters where um, persons had a substance abuse problem. And it worked. Um, and they, they had a good run of it and they may still be doing it. And it would be great to talk to them about how they did it. They also, after um, experimenting with the um, joint jurisdiction court, looked at the possibility of developing a tribal juvenile wellness court that focused exclusively on adolescents. And that they had already had a long-standing diversion program that included circle process for working with young people who were caught up in the state juvenile justice system. They also have a wellness center on site. Um, and I give you a picture of it, Denina Wellness Center, and it's it's got a lot of stuff, like it's got a medical facility, behavioral health, chemical dependency, um, traditional healing and wellness. I show you this because Kenaitse in Kenai, Alaska, which is in the southeastern part of Alaska, um, is the ideal situation where you have all the resources in one little town and the tribe and the state can work closely together and pool those resources in a joint jurisdiction setting. And guess what? They not only serve um, members of the tribe, they serve residents of Kenai, even if they're not native. And so this is sort of the perfect scenario here for a joint jurisdiction court. Uh, and we'll be talking to them more to see how it went and see how it's going. Um, and, and find the key persons to, to share with all of you in the publication. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so I wanted to give you some critics and critiques of all of what we're looking at here. Um, so we can have some dialogue about what we think about the potential for developing tribal healing to wellness courts in Alaska, either single, joint, or intertribal. 
Okay, so the first critics I, I picked on here are native and non-native critics in Alaska. And actually they could be out of Alaska too. So what I'm hearing is they are saying that the drug court model is a US federally incentivized model. It's a Western model, it's not a native thing. And that at worst, it is a colonial imposition. They have, they share some disdain for the Western adversarial court process and the Western substance abuse and behavioral health treatment approaches. Um, they might argue that the only appropriate approach is an Alaska Native community culturally driven approach. And they might talk about um, culture camps um, or circle process. And I would just point out that um, I guess one of the things that leaps out at me is that because of the contests over whether tribes are sovereign and have jurisdiction in Alaska, they've been radically under-resourced. And so a lot of the very important work being done by native communities up here is in the prevention area and not the intervention area because that requires a recognition of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction when you've already got native people in prison or in the state court system. Um, so I guess I would ask the question of Alaska native critics is, is it important for tribal governments to have control over intervening um, for their tribal members who are already um, engaged or involved in the state court system? Um, and then they would have to answer that one way or the other. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, tribal advocates would argue and have argued that um, hybrid models are okay, syncretic models are okay. What does syncretic mean? Um, it means a combination of different forms of belief or practice. Cultural syncretism is when an aspect of two or more distinct cultures blend together to create a new custom, idea, practice, or philosophy. Many folks would argue that tribal healing to wellness courts are syncretic. They're taking some of the things that work from the Western justice and therapeutic systems and some of the things that um, work in the tribal culture and tradition and weaving them together in a new model, a new system. Um, what's important about tribal healing to wellness courts, they would argue, is they're tribally controlled and designed. Um, and that these tribal teams plan, design, and implement their idea of what will work. There's also federal funding to do this. It's an, a huge opportunity to tailor tribal laws um, and uh, to culture and values. Um, to something that's locally provided and something that's under tribal control. And of course, tribes ultimately decide how to design and implement their programs. Okay, let me just do a chime check here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, there are other critics, of course, and other critiques, um, for example, People who are in the state drug court programs or who are with the National Association of Drug Court Professionals who design the training for all states and tribal teams nationally, they might look at the situation of rural Alaska and argue that Alaska tribes lack fully elaborated tribal court systems. So not, their laws are not fully developed. Um, their jurisdiction is contested. They may not have the criminal jurisdiction they need if they want to do adult drug courts. Um, they um, may not think they may be able to support a therapeutic docket alongside their criminal docket, their juvenile docket, and their family docket. What's a docket, you might be asking? <laughs> um, so inside of a court system, in, in uh, my Hopi tribal court system, um, we get thousands of cases a year. We, have, we hold thousands of hearings a year and they come in different flavors. Some of them involve parents who've 
neglected their children, some of them involve crimes, some of them involve juvenile offenses. And so um, different Hopi judges get assigned to different kinds of cases like the, the children's cases, um, that's called the children's docket. It's a, a way of lumping cases together with a judge who handles that kind of case. Same with juvenile cases, same with criminal cases. Now, and they do this in the state court system too. Now you might say, well, tribes in Alaska don't get that many cases. And so we don't need dockets. Um, and that may be true. Um, but in order for me to talk about the therapeutic docket being different from say the juvenile court docket, I have to say docket so that you know it's two different systems inside a tribal court. And so that's what I'm doing and we can, we can argue about that some more. Okay, so um, the state system proponents and the NADCP critics might feel that circle process can be a part of, but it can't be a substitute for the entire tribal court or the entire drug court system. Um, they would see that as a diversion program and it could be part of a phased treatment plan inside of a tribal healing to wellness court, but it can't replace completely those systems. Uh, and if it does, it's just a completely different system. Okay, let's go forward one more. Okay, well, what about the rebuttal from tribal healing to wellness court advocates? So um, they would argue that circle process is being used successfully by a number of tribes. However, it, it shouldn't be the only possibility and it could be integrated into a tribal healing to wellness court. They would argue that each tribe is sovereign and they have the prerogative to experiment with hybrid models to innovate and or to integrate circle process as part of the whole system. Um, they would, some might worry that circle process is convenient for state entities uh, that, that are um, stingy about jurisdiction. They really don't want to recognize tribal courts, tribal sovereignty or tribal jurisdiction. So they are happy with circle process because it looks like a mere diversion program where all the activity can stay in state court and then just go to circle process. Now that, that, that's not to say that circle process isn't very valuable, it is. And also we recognize that in some places like cake, there is almost like a joint jurisdiction arrangement for circle process that's worked incredibly well. But um, I guess what the tribal healing to wellness court advocates would argue is that some tribes may want to have a different way. They may want uh, a tribal healing to wellness court. Okay, let's go forward one slide. So critics and critiques again with the state and the National Association of Drug Court Professionals might argue that um, drug courts won't work for tribes in rural Alaska because they don't house or control their treatment entities locally at the village level. They'd say, hey, we noticed that your resources are controlled by distant third parties, those regional native nonprofits that are located in distant cities. Um, and so how are your youth, um, your family members in your village going to access treatment every week or however frequently it's required under a phased treatment plan? Um, they might argue that fidelity or staying true to the drug court model is not possible for drug court participants in the village because they can't access the day-to-day -day required elements of their phase treatment plans. Okay, let's go forward one. They would have another similar argument with law enforcement. Um, again, they would argue that um, even the village public safety officers are resourced and controlled by distant third parties, the native nonprofits. Um, 
it would be hard to uh, remain true to the drug court treatment model if law enforcement is not present to participate in the intensive monitoring of participants in a, in a tribal drug court program. So for example, in some tribes in the lower 48, um, law enforcement does the drug and alcohol testing of people who are in the program, and that can happen on a weekly basis. So you'd have to have pretty frequent interaction. The alternative would be to hire someone like a probation officer or um, a, there's other names for this in um, the model code that would do that same function and not have to rely on law enforcement. Um, but these guys might argue that the only way you can have a, a tribal drug court in Alaska is a state tribal joint jurisdiction drug court for all of these reasons. Okay, let's go forward one. So what would the tribal healing to wellness court advocates argue? They'd say, look, Alaska tribes have been and are developing their court systems and laws and maybe even their law enforcement systems. Um, in the past, tribes in Alaska and tribal courts have been suppressed and under-resourced. This has violated US federal Indian law principles, the trust responsibility, and Alaska Native Indigenous Peoples rights under the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So as a consequence, Alaska tribes must be supported in their justice system development and capacity uh, building efforts. And this includes funding and patience and giving them a chance to do trial and error and see what works just like the states did. Um, so there, there are some compelling arguments um, coming back from the tribes here. Okay, let's go forward one more. And I promise this is the last slide. Okay, so the last bit of argument from the, the tribal advocate side here is that Alaska tribes have the authority to do these kinds of courts, but they need help with resources um, and the development and operation of treatment programs that are local or at least with access locally. And tribal law enforcement entities that are local. And given issues of practicality, geography, the state budget crisis and differential funding, um, it's valuable to look at both the tribal state joint jurisdiction model and an inter-tribal drug court model and um, inter-tribal um, within sub-regions of Alaska. These are both worth looking at given the resource constraints in the short term. Also, the state must come to respect and support the concurrent tribal regulatory and adjudicatory jurisdiction and collaborate with tribes and tribal courts going forward. This has certainly been done by the Alaska Supreme Court and we, and we hope that the executive branch and the legislature will follow here in Alaska. Okay, so I just threw a ton of stuff at you. Um, your brains are probably hurting. Let's, let me stop babbling and see if we have any comments or questions. Hi, Pat. Um, so we had somebody asking about the, where to find the model juvenile code. So I just want to bring everybody's attention to the chats. Um, I posted a link to BIA's 2016 revision to the model Indian juvenile code. In addition, I also posted um, a resource developed by TLPI um, that looks at drafting or revising tribal juvenile delinquency and status offense laws. And that goes into um, a lot of other problem solving courts as well. So you'll see a few healing to wellness court examples there. Um, Lastly, I want to note that TLPI and a crew of our consultants are working on developing a tribal juvenile justice code resource that looks at integrating the BIA's model Indian juvenile code. And what's particularly helpful with this resource is that we're also adding um, critical commentary from folks that, were, um, that assisted in drafting that model Indian juvenile code. 
So that hasn't been um, fully developed yet. So it hasn't um, been submitted or approved by BJA, but once it does, uh, TLPI will disseminate that to the field. Um, somebody says, thank you, Pat, and that's a good job. Yes, it was a lot to cover. Um, I just wanna say one thing about the model code, which is that um, if you fully adopted the model code, you would have the Ferrari of juvenile, tribal juvenile laws. And you might not need a Ferrari, you might just need a small pickup truck. So it is possible to scale it down to make sense for your small village with its lesser needs than the Ferrari. Um, so don't think you have to adopt the whole, the whole Ferrari. Yeah, and also that Ferrari costs a lot more money than a pickup truck. This is money that your um, tribal court or program may not have. And in that, um, the model um, juvenile code talks about making sure you have these different staff um, on your team and all that. And we all know that our budgets are quite lean. So just taking a look at what, what your community um, resources are and what their needs are, um, that's, that's a great start. Okay, so did we have any, um, did we have any comments about um, whether you're a, whether your tribe prefers to have a tribal court and a wellness program or whether it's only a wellness program where the state court is the court part? Um, and are there good reasons for doing it one way or the other? Um, you can type that in the chat if you like. Um, let's see. There's a lot of chat there, so I'm going to have to leave it to my, my fellow facilitators to see if there's anything I missed. Okay, so we have folks um, saying that they have an adult healing to wellness court and a family healing to wellness court. Um, some folks are just starting their own tribal court or starting their um, healing to wellness, um, adult and juvenile programs. Um, so I think, yeah, that's all we have right now. But yeah, it would be really, it would be really great, especially for those that are just starting up. What sorts of um, considerations are you thinking about? And are there any questions that Pat can help you? Because she's helped, um, she's worked with closely with TLPI in. Um, helping a lot of courts develop their healing to wellness court program. So she has a wealth of information um, for any new courts trying to get off the ground. And if any of you um, wanna get in contact with us uh, after this presentation, contact TLPI and they can funnel either your feedback or your questions to me um, and I'll get back to you. I'm happy to help. All right, Pat, I don't see any new uh, questions coming in. All right, I'll turn the video over to you. Thank you so much again, Pat, um, for everything that you shared today. And thank you everyone for attending today's Juvenile Track Workshop special considerations with tribal healing to wellness courts in Alaska and the prospects for an inter-tribal juvenile healing to wellness court. Recordings will be posted in the virtual training space and will remain up until July 30th. After this time, you may find recordings at enhancementtraining.org.